uh, places when when I, I tonight is going to be animal stories, animal encounters, but the encounters are are all about where they happen because I, I don't think we. I don't think animals, I don't think plants, I don't think any of, of the world exists in isolation. It exists in a place. It in, exists in a landscape, in an environment. And, uh, and I wanna take you to a, a number of environments tonight. Let me just start by reading a, a short piece, um, just a couple paragraphs I wrote from uh, the mangy forests of the Pacific Northwest far from any trail. I waited by a shallow wandering river. Hemlock and red cedars parted to allow a cloudy gray window above. We picked this tumbled crowd of life and death to rest where moss poured from ragged stumps and roots upended. There are places where the earth conspires, elements joining, as if you've stepped into the animal landscape. I can't say why we stayed quiet, but after a minute or two, neither of us wanted to break the spell. We'd been backpacking through the deep woods of the Olympics, crawling over these, these enormous, monstrous trees fallen from the wind until it felt like we were as deep as a person could go. And we didn't want to break the spell. There is something about being silent, being hidden in the woods. There are many reasons to come to a standstill in the woods, the way shadows spill into themselves, trees toppled, rotting, covered in life. The river echoed into a gorge made of living things, tall Pacific conifers, primordial in darkness and heft. A herd of elk emerged from shadows, antlers turning and lowering, ears of cow elk flicking off mosquitoes. They stepped into water as clear as ice, looking upstream and down to see who might be here, not finding us among so many stumps and flood-rooted wind-down trees. I don't remember breathing as if I were holding in my scent. I didn't want them to know I was here. I wanted to just see them. These were the largest of the American elk, a subspecies nearly moose in size, heads and necks as dark as polished teak, fur of their bodies pale as moonlight. They would have glowed had it been any darker, their procession lighting up the tree vault. The elk passed into shadows on the other side with only a pause from the great antlered bull who may have looked at us or may have not peering along the river one last time before they all were gone. These encounters that we have with animals, often it's just like that. It is just a passing, a glance. And you realize that it's not so much about just that one moment. It is everything around you. It is, it is the smell of the place. It is the flow of the water and how it sounds echoing in the trees. Animals are about their, their landscapes. I think it's, it's true for us too. We are about our places. We are animals as well. It is all about where you are what is around you, what you smell, what you drink, the shade you take. Not too long ago, just a, a few weeks ago, we found fireflies out here where we live. Now, if you live somewhere, um, somewhere more humid in the world, uh, maybe, maybe Cleveland, uh, I think you probably have uh, fireflies out there. Uh, maybe you're used to them. I don't know how you could ever get used to fireflies. But out here, you just do not see them. I think three times in my life have I seen fireflies in the dry west. And, um, and, and just a few weeks ago, or maybe a month or so ago, we, we found a place down on a river uh, not too far from here where at dusk, we started seeing the little flashes of electric green light. And 
and and that's just absurd in this landscape. It's just, it's not something you grow up with. It's not something you ever see. And as the night went on, they grew, the lights flashing more and more. There weren't many of them. At, at first, we can only count uh, um, two or three at a time for about an hour. And that was enough. Just to see that is magical, to see the, the males up high flickering and flashing and the females down in the grass. And then there were more. Then there were five, 10, 15. Maybe there were no more than 20 in the end, but along the river, they had gathered in, in these low uh, whip snap willows under the cottonwood trees, and they were flashing to each other, communicating, talking, telling their story. When you watch something like this, you'll see one just take off, flying away, and you'll see the, the, the glance of its light, and then it's gone. But you saw its life for that moment. You see everything gathered here. Maybe there was something about the, the humidity of this certain spot. The, the river hits bedrock in this place, and so the, the water kind of spreads out, and the grand, ground is a little damp. So maybe it was, it was adjusted humidity. I don't know what it was, but this place was magical. And I found a, a comment by, by two Chilean uh, biologists, uh, Umberto Materna and Francisco Varela, who, uh, who are studying uh, life systems. And they wrote, living systems are cognitive systems. And living as a process is a process of cognition. This statement is lawful for all organisms with or without a nervous system. That line really struck me because we often think of animal encounters as, as the bear or the bighorn sheep when sometimes it is fireflies. And we as humans align with things that are like us and we think, oh, that's, that's got a face or that's got hands or that has claws so it's closer to us. But all of these things are part of this living web flowing in and out of each other. My sweetheart and I went back uh, a couple of weeks later to see if it was still going on, to see if uh, the fireflies flies were still flashing. And we went out at dusk and we were standing there by the river and they came out again. And there weren't so many. So I think there's a, just a period of maybe two or three weeks where this happens. And I'll be checking back in the coming years but you could see the females glowing from down on the ground and she picked one up in her hands and it, it walked across her fingers and she held it inside of her hand, the light coming out as if from a lantern. And then she opened her hand and it walked onto mine, glowing that electric green. But it wasn't the only animal there that night. As this was just starting up, as dusk was, was just leaving with that last pointless light, we were facing each other and I said, there's a fox right behind you, right behind you. And she turned slowly and looked and there was a, a fox that had come up behind her and was studying us. And it kind of circled us and sat down and watched us for a while because it was on a route and we were in the middle of it and it was curious about us. It wanted to converse or it wanted to find out what we were. It stayed with us for maybe five minutes before trotting away. And then we were facing each other again. And she said, right behind you, right behind you, there's a skunk. And I turned and looked and there was a striped skunk trotting down the trail right behind me. And uh, hold on a second. Hey boys. Teenagers, another kind of animal. Hey, Jado, Jasper, a little quieter. They live in the house. They make nests back there. You see them on occasion. 
So the skunk walked up behind me and, and I, it was heading straight for me as if it didn't know I was there. And I moved slightly, which startled it. And it turned around and ran off, but it kept trying to poke its way through walking along the river, checking to see where we were. And then later that night after the fireflies had died off a little bit, the fox came back and circled us and sat and watched. And you have these moments with animals and you're, you're looking around saying, this has something to do with the fireflies. It has something to do with the, the skunk. This is a place. This is like that spot along the river in the Olympics where something happens. You have a moment where you encounter other beings, other creatures who are thinking, maybe not like you're thinking, a different kind of thought, a different spectrum, but still sentient. I would say from the skunk to the fox, to the firefly. I want to take you to a place now that, uh, that is, uh, I, I'm interested in where animals congregate, where, where they, they come together and, and what they're doing, where, especially where it's a single species, what's happening in this one place. So I'm gonna share this video with you right now. Let's see if this works. This is a secret place. I can't tell you where this is. I can tell you that it is in the desert and it's rare. There's a, uh, a small canyon system here that has aspen trees growing inside of it. And this is a, a relic population of, of aspens. They were probably here in the ice age and then as, uh, as the cold retreated, the land up on top dried out, the aspens came down into these little canyons and they stayed here. And this is their place. The, uh, this is a, a series of canyons where each one is deep and it's, it's got a little bit of moisture inside of it and coolness, so the aspens gather here. Uh, this is the smaller grove. There's a bigger one over the top of this on the other side. And these aspen groves, are marking places. All the aspen trees in these groves are scratched up. You can see these long claw marks coming down. These marks are mountain lions. I've never seen a gathering like this. You, you see uh, uh, aspen trees that are marked up by them, but, but not that are marked all around and every single tree is scratched up. And it's as if the mountain lions know that when you, when you scratch an aspen tree, give it enough years and that will darken and will become a sign. And you can imagine the mountain lions jumping up onto this thing and their weight pulling them down, that their arms are wrapped around it and their claws are dug into it as if tearing apart the spine of a deer. This is where they gather. I wonder about places where animals come together. What are they doing, even if it's over generations? I mean, the, the markings here are going on 30, 40, 50 years, as long as, as aspen trees live. And this is where they come to do it. This is where they come to what? Show that they are here, like the handprints painted on a canyon. If you go down this drainage, not probably about four miles that direction, there's a boulder with a human handprint uh, pecked into it. Is that what this place is, is, is a marking saying, we are here, this is us. This is the landscape of mountain lions and this is where we come together. I mean, what does a mountain lion ceremony look like? Cats are such different animals than us. Is this what we're seeing here? Ceremony, gathering, the animals telling their story because every animal has a story and maybe not every animal gathers but they all leave a mark even if it is just 
a little nick in the aspen tree. I want to tell you a story about coming on one of these gatherings. Not a mountain lion gathering, different animal. I was in the, uh, in the sandstone desert of southeast Utah on an extended backpack with a group of friends. And, uh, and I'd split off at dawn and was walking through a basin, this, this cliff-walled basin with canyons cut back through it into the rock. And I saw ravens flying toward, toward this one little canyon in the back of the basin. And, uh, and it, was, it was multiple ravens. Um, you know, first it was one and then it was a couple more. And then, uh, then pretty soon I maybe counted 10 or 15 ravens flying into this one narrow space. And, you know, I'd always wondered where the ravens are going because sometimes you see them out on the horizon all flying to the same point. And they're notoriously intelligent birds. So what are they doing together? And this was a rare chance to, uh, to actually witness it, to go see what the raven looked to so I followed them into the canyon. And, you know, I thought, uh, I thought that I was, I was being uh, <laughs> Mr. Ninja, a stealthy, you know, moving quietly through the bottom of this canyon, which was catastrophic with fallen boulders. And, and, uh, and I, I thought, I'm going to come around the corner, and they're not going to know that I'm here. They're all going to look up, and, and what? What is going to happen next? They're, they're gathered around the fro frozen carcass of a, of a fallen bighorn sheep, or, or what are they doing back here? When I came around the corner, ready to peek out, hoping to see them in action, I found maybe 30 ravens all staring at me. They were on ledges and on rock points. They were all over the canyon and they were all still stationary in their robes like judges, heads turned looking at me, which was chilling to be seen by so many ravens all at once. Do you really want that many birds looking at you? That many dark, wild birds, big beaks, big wings. Ravens are not small birds. Well, I decided to keep walking into them to see what was up. Why were they here? Why weren't they flying away? What are they doing back here? The closer I got, the more agitated they became. They began to, to call and, and then jump off of their, their rocks and fly across the other side of the canyon only about 20 feet away and then fly back and forth. So they were lacing the canyon and calling, getting louder and louder, more of them in the air as I came under them. And they're screeching then, all these ravens flying all around me. Then I saw these little pucks of, of rocks landing, pebbles that they were picking up and twigs. They were dropping over me. I didn't know what was going on. There was so much loudness. They, they you know, they, they mob other birds, uh, raptors, owls, eagles, uh, hawks, and, and just drive them crazy to get them out of a territory. And I, the, th the same thing was happening here. And looking up and I said, I don't know what you're saying. And the sound of my voice just incensed them, drove them to go faster and louder. And of course, I knew exactly what they were saying. They were saying, get out of here. This is not your place. So I left, walked back out of the canyon, and, and they all calmed down. They went back to their places. And quieted, returned to their ledges and perches, all with their heads turned facing me. And so I, uh, I walked out of there, and I went and found my friends, and I, you know, for us, ravens are the gods of this landscape. They are the ones we see day in and day out. The, the other animals that you feel like you're communicating with, that they, they fly in low and they talk to you, they look at you, they interact with you. And we'd all wondered where they go when they disappear into, into off onto the horizon. And I said, I found the place. 
I don't know what's going on there, but we have to go. And so four of us walked back to that canyon and uh, walked in through all the boulders fallen all around each other. And when we entered, the same thing happened. The ravens were all facing us, staring. And we walked into the dark enclosure of this space. And as we came closer to them, they did the same thing. They hopped off of their perches they flew over our heads. They started mobbing us and screaming and screeching. And, and we're trying to figure out what's going on here. Why are they all in this one space? And that's when we started to find uh, owl feathers that have been stuck under rocks or stuck up in a crack in the, in the canyon wall. And, and we found more and more of them and it was all one species. It was all the same owl. And, and uh, if you lifted up one of the feathers, they, all the ravens would come to you and they'd be swirling around you with the feather until you put it down. And some of the quills had been pecked so fiercely they had been pulped. And they were put under rocks so they wouldn't blow away maybe, or we were looking up the side of the canyon and 30, 40, 50 feet up, our, ra our uh, owl feathers sticking out of the rock. And what we figured is the owls had driven, or the ravens had driven an owl back here and had mobbed it and had killed it in this place. And that this must be where they return to commemorate that moment. This must be where they gather to remember who they are. There are cultures of ravens. There are dialects of ravens. The animal speaks in a different way in a different region. The language can almost be broken down into words. What are they doing out here? This is their world. This is their ceremony. Owl feathers all around the canyon. And we backed out of that place. And the ravens returned to their perches and returned to whatever it is they are doing out here in their world. So I think about these places where, where animals come together. Um, and, and we, it's, it's so easy to think that the world is ours, that it, it belongs to humans. Uh, we, we enter our own minds and, and it, we forget, I forget. I think it is about my bills, my deadlines, the, the things that I have to do every day and, and then uh, an animal sweeps across in front of me. Often it's birds. I remember a, a dear friend of mine uh, back when, when he and I were guiding in, uh, in Baja, guiding sea kayak trips, we were having encounters with birds, ravens, kestrels. And, and he, he said, every time you see a bird, it's a message. And that's, that's stuck with me ever since that, uh, that maybe they aren't coming to talk with me, but they're coming, their, their presence signals something. Maybe it signals just enough to look up, to look around you, to realize that you are not the only species. You are not the only thing out here. Uh, just recently, I was, I was backpacking with, with, uh, with my boys. Um, uh, we, were, we were doing a, a trek in the, in the coastal redwoods of California. Uh, last week and, and we were finding banana slugs. And, uh, and you, you encounter these, these bright yellow 
creatures uh, with without spinal cords and and you watch them i one morning i watched one for for half an hour and it and i put down my pen next to it uh, to to photograph it for scale and it turned around and it, it got onto my pen and it covered the length of the pen and wrapped around the clicker and then turned around and came back the other way and you just see the way its eye stalks are sticking out if anything disturbs them they, they pop back so quickly and then tentatively come out you know that animal feels maybe that animal feels more than we do it is so sensitive to the world crawling over leaves not crawling but flowing and seeing the world you know how do animals encounter this world each species so different where i'm sure that ravens look at raccoons and go ah raccoons and ra and raccoons look up at ravens and go yeah ravens we all see each other as different kinds of animals which we are but we flow together i'm thinking of a, a time uh, that i encountered starlings uh, some people call them sky carp uh, they are uh, non-natives to uh, to north america uh, european starlings and I, I encountered them once from a, from a curious spot. I was, I was in Seattle, and this was uh, decades ago, um, when I, I worked with a, a publisher there. It was one of my first books. Uh, um, it was Secret Knowledge of Water. And I was with a publisher called Sasquatch Books. And, uh, and they were on, I think, the 12th or 14th story of a, of a building downtown. And they had access to the roof. And I like to go right in odd places. So I would climb up the ladder from their office onto the roof and right up there and look over at the alley below and see what was going on. And often it wasn't human activity that was the most fascinating. It was animal activity. It was seeing uh, crows who were, who were fussing over a, uh, um, a plastic bag grocery bag blowing down the street and watching their interactions as they were they were moving around this thing and i saw starlings while i was up there i saw starlings flying through the city it was this was in downtown so there were a lot of uh, tall buildings around and they were flying between buildings but they were in large groups which um is called a murmuration when it's not just a flock, it's a, it's a different kind of, of, of equation. When birds are flying in mass and they're, they, they seem to become a whole organism. And uh, let, me, let me share this, this with you. Um, this is a murmuration of starlings and this is uh you know this is a very large group and i was probably seeing 100 or 200 maybe 300 starlings at a time flowing through the building so imagine this swirling through downtown this this uh, amoeba like complex going between the buildings and you know usually i'm looking for wild animals in the wild but they are everywhere they are deep in the cities and and these murmurations like this is an incredible to see some complex movement somewhere in the early 1900s anthropologists were playing around with the notion that these were actually telekinetic instances where where they were reading each other's minds um and and the mass of bird birds was able to think collectively which may be true scientifically i mean not necessarily reading each other's minds but reading each other's movements scientifically this is considered the rapid transmission of local behavioral response to neighbors so a large group behavior performed synchronistically and this can happen in a couple of ways in a society uh, uh, one is top down where you have a leadership directing the mass, but this, this is different. This is uh, self-organizing, small individual behaviors scaling up to the larger group. 
which is how most living things, most of the universe works. It flows, and this is how it flows. Uh, who is keeping track of whom out here? It turns out that the number is seven birds. One bird interacts with seven others around it, keeping track of how the birds are moving, forming a cell. And each of those seven birds connects to another seven and so on until you have this, this self-thinking mass. And this is what I was seeing flying through Seattle. And, and I was seeing it on different streets and they all were kind of heading to the same location. So I decided to go find out where the Sarlings were going. I dropped down onto the street and I followed them for blocks as they were these submarine organic shapes flowed between buildings. I followed them to one particular block where they were all landing at once and there were tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of starlings on this one downtown street and it was mania. There were trees along the street and if one starling flew into a tree, another one had to fly out. There was no more room. The branches were hanging down and it was this cacophony of bird sounds and all the cars were covered with bird droppings. And this was the mass. This is where they all came to. I don't know what was going on in this place. I had to get under uh, the eave of a building because there was, it was just overwhelming. People out on the street were, were running to get, to get out from under them. And I thought, this, this is miraculous. Like this must just happen once in a lifetime. They've come to this place. And I was under the awning of a restaurant and a cook came outside to, uh, to smoke a cigarette. And, I, and he looked rather calm about it. I said, oh my God, what, what's happening here? And he, he was smoking a cigarette and he said, yep, every night about five o'clock, this is what happens. And this is the place. This is where they chose. Every night, all the starlings of Seattle, or most of them, it appeared, would come to this one place. Why? What is going on in their worlds? We live in our lives, and like I said, we, we don't often look up. But when we do, we realize that there are other animals. The majority of life on Earth is, is doing its thing is living life like we are. And maybe humans are like this murmuration. We think we have presidents and leaders and, and we govern ourselves, but really we are flying within view of the seven who are around us, who are watching the seven around them, who are forming this organic form that maybe we can't see. Maybe we're so deep in it, we're just hearing the, the shouting of everybody and the wing beats and we're, we're interacting and we're finding our place, but maybe we can't see how beautiful we are. This is the world I'm looking for. The world of animals moving all around us, living their lives. I want to tell you one more story. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna try something here. I'm going to share a screen with you in a moment, but this is from my book, uh, Animal Dialogues, and it's the chapter on coyote. Ragged and tired, we reached the Air Motor USA windmill after two weeks of crossing the Sonoran Desert. Water cranks out of the desert here like ice from the center of the sun. At the windmill, was the first of our two food caches, hidden 112 degrees and a few hundred yards southeast of the well, under a Palo Verde tree. Our next cache was another week away. Backpacks were dropped as if we were shedding skin, a snake-like move that made sense now. We sat and waited for evening, then it got about the small tasks of preparing a meal. Behind us, a single coyote barked a few times. The voice searched the area and found no other coyotes. We looked up, then returned to work. Again, the bark came closer. When it came a third time, 
We both stood and scanned the cross-hatched shadows of Palo Verdes and creosote bushes. My traveling companion, Irvin Fernandez, grabbed his binoculars and loped in one direction, hunched to the height of the creosote. I saw motion through the spaces, parts of a coyote on the move up a nearby wash. Irvin was fixed on it from another vantage, signaling that he could see it. The coyote obeys something internal that requires it to sing even when solitary. The singing brings them together. It creates a detailed map of coyotes across a landscape. About a third of all coyotes will be in packs, another third traveling in pairs, and the remaining third going solo. The coyote barked again, and I was surprised there was no answer. I slipped my flute, long wooden in Japanese, from my pack and started playing to see what would happen. Holding the binoculars to his eye, I could not see the animal. Thinking he moved on, I stopped playing. Without losing the sight of the carrying signal, but the hand keep going, and so I played. And as I did, he gestured more, winding his hand in the air, saying, "Play, play." I played high and furious. I felt the clear sensation of my brain grasping the air. My embouchure muscles began to ache. Irvin climbed the windmill tower and fused with the fading western sky. Calm evening air, legs and earth. I walked toward him, covering the sound of my footsteps with street lights. I was lost in the music. The sight became deep. Finally, I stopped and inhaled deeply. My vision dazzled with an oxygen starved brain. It sat down, he whispered to me. It's just sitting there. Listen. Slowly I climbed the metal tower, and when I reached Irvin, I turned and held up my binoculars. Coyote was sitting in the open, truly in the open. The nearest plant was a chubalosa in full red bloom, twenty feet away. The coyote, perhaps accustomed to strange motions and noises from the windmill, ignored us. Its ears were perked, and after it turned its head in all directions, it ducked nose to tail and closed its eyes. When it did this, it turned to stand. Occasionally, I glanced up to a shift in the wind or the sound of a quail covey. My hands grew sore, gripped to the steel of the windmill. The stone turned back to a coyote. It rose from the ground and stood facing west. It barked. Its tone suggested that it was feeling the terrain with its voice. The coyote allowed enough time for each sound to drift away before introducing the next. Each bark prompted a tug on the tail that turned it under the coyote's belly, the tip of its tail black. Because I had heard it was the coyote who stole fire and brought it to the human. He stole it by thrusting his own tail into the first fire, turning the end black. It was the coyote who brought us fire and light. The bark continued into the world, not finding an answer. The coyote faced west, expecting an answer, and not yielding to silence. The barking was like cool play, soft in the air that was then taken up by a solitary howling. The coyote's head lifted to send the song upward, tail tucked far under. The song echoed. The coyote waited. There is a loneliness about a coyote not answered. The spaces are much more open, devoid of the social pleasures of the pack animals. At other times, there would be the feeling of the coyotes having eaten rabbits or mice, unfolding themselves on warm rocks in the day, several of them with lazy eyes, a family. Now we were all very far away, alone. Now the land was so huge. It went on as far as the coyote's voice will carry. And there was nothing to impede the sound. The only home the coyote had was that bushy tail. And if I had it, I would curl beneath it and remain very still. 
The coyote did not grow anxious. It did not scratch disappointment into the dirt. It howled again. One bark returned from the west. So far away, it could have been only a strand of hair slipping over my left ear. Coyote ears stood erect, registering the sound, telling me it was real. Two barks, then howling. The entire desert in a few seconds was a cacophony of coyotes shouting back and forth. The desert changed instantly. It turned from stones to coyotes. Whining went high with shouts and yelps hurled from all directions. They were everywhere, although from the top of the windmill, I could not see them at all. The first coyote wasted no time in trotting west into the sound. As soon as it was beyond the arroyo, we lost it. Irvin and I climbed down and walked wordlessly to camp. There we returned to our small tasks. Soon we ate hot pasole with rice. Isolated coyote packs released songs into the night sky. Their frenetic tones took the desert and pushed it even farther than the loneliness could take it, connecting far points with strings of sound. The two of us with our warm pots of food were no more than objects dangling in a web, witnesses to the lives of coyotes. That's a chapter from my book, uh, Animal Dialogues. And I hear coyotes, probably most of us hear them, and we hear the way they're talking, the way they're calling across distances, the way this landscape is theirs, but not theirs alone. You look into it deeper and you find the bears, you find the eagles, you find the swallows and the fireflies. You find in the city, the starlings flying all to a single point. This is their world and ours as well. We are animals. I think back to that quote from the Chilean biologist, living systems are cognitive systems. They are thinking. We think of ourselves as individuals. And to a degree we are, but really we're within a web of interactions. We're within a greater mind of wild animals that surround us, that are here all the time. Thank you for listening to these stories tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Craig. So, uh, hi, Rebecca. <laughs> We're going to entertain some questions and a lot of wonderful comments. Um, you all in the chat can use the chat or the Q and A and um, share some questions. It's nice to see the comments. Thank you, you guys. I see them popping up down below. I appreciate you being here to hear these stories. So I'm. I'm open for any questions, Re Rebecca, if you want to field anything to me. Sure. The, um, I noticed in your bio that you said you spent part of your life as a professional musician. I was curious <laughs> if it was flute only or if you have other instruments you play. No, flute came later. I was a trombone player, <laughs> uh, which doesn't go as well in the backcountry, but I used to play uh, um, symphony and jazz. Uh, in, in my 20s, uh, so I, I did that professionally for a little while, but I was also a river guide at the same time, so I was in the wow. pod cookie, which hasn't really changed that much. We do have a question from Bob Hartzell. What is the biggest lesson you have learned from animals, birds, etc.? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, the biggest lesson. I guess what comes to mind Im immediately is, is the lesson that... Uh, that they aren't other, that, that, they, that, that everything that we do can be found in the animal world, that our, our building of elaborate governmental systems and architecture is found in, in anthills uh, and termite mounds, that, uh, that we think that our traits are, are just human and unique to us. But I, I guess I, 
every time I come up with, with something that says, okay, this is human and only human, some emotional capacity or linguistic capacity, I, I realize it's, it's not. And so the biggest lesson is, is to realize that, that we are animal as well. I don't know if that's what you're asking in particular, but that's what comes to mind. That's a wonderful answer. We um, had a speaker a number of years ago, Mark Beckoff, who works with the Jane Goodall Institute. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. He, he did two lectures on the sentient nature of animals, and it was very moving and tied in very much with what you said. That we have a question about um, if someone wondering if you are a vegetarian. Uh, no, I'm not a vegetarian. Um, I eat animals. Um, uh, it's, it is also something that I, I struggle with. I, but I, I recognize that, uh, that we are in a world of eating each other, but I think it's also, I think the industrial use of animals is, is something that I try to avoid. Uh, but I, you know, there are times that I don't, there are times, I mean, just on this trip with my boys where we were grabbing whatever meat we could find on the road. Um, I'm, I think I'm an opportunist, but then there's part of me that is always kind of pulling back and going, well, if you really carry this out, what you believe about animals, uh, you wouldn't be doing this. Um, it's, it's a thing that's on my mind. I'm just, I, it, it fluctuates throughout my life. Okay. And, and we got lots of questions now. They're popping up. Do you feel the spirituality of creatures in the loosest sense of the word? The spirituality of creatures. Well, I think it's more, it's probably more, I mean, we're always going over boundaries, right? Uh, um, the boundary between you and another animal, um, which I think that that is spirit. I th and, and I, I think each animal, probably each individual, has a different place in the world, which maybe, maybe the spirit. Um, I, I mean, I th I think about it spiritually. I think, it, but animals might not break it down to uh, to uh, distinct categories of this is spirit, this is mind. Um, maybe that is more of a human thing, but I'm sure that uh, that that ravens do that too. Ravens probably sense the spirituality of humans, of each individual. But I, I do feel like it's a very, that, that world of crossing over into other animals is, is, a, is a spiritual realm. It is, it is your spirit meeting another spirit, another, another being. But, but I also think it's true when you meet other people. I think of animals as people, I guess, which goes back to that question, the vegetarian question, like, oh, I eat people. Mm. Oh. So then um, someone asks, can you please tell us a bit about your next book? <laughs> well, I don't know what the next book is exactly. Uh, it, it's kind of an organic process, and, and I am thinking a lot about animals these days, uh, I've, I've been right here where I live, which is, um, give you a, a vista here. I, I live in Southwest Colorado and there's a canyon right below the house here that is a migratory corridor. Mountain lions are moving here through here all the time. Um, and I've been trying to find my way into their world, setting up blinds, um, and I think that there is a book that, that is rising out of that because I, I don't, I'm not trying to speak for animals. I'm trying to be a, a voice that they can kind of, I can say, here's what they're doing. Here's where they live. Um, uh, so this, this book is about, if this book actually comes together, is, is about uh, being in their landscape and seeing them moving through it and and figuring out how I can relate to them, how you know I go from invading their place to being still in their place to the reciprocity of, of like that fox coming to us at the fireflies. Like I want to get to that point where the animals are coming to me and we are having a conversation. So that's, 
that's kind of what I'm working on right now, but I'm also assembling urban stories. You know, I've got some great encounters in New York City with, with animals. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about animals these days, obviously. That's awesome. We'll look forward to the next book. Uh, here's a question. Craig, I know you've spent time in many dry places, but even there, wildlife depend on the rare locations of water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Over your years of exploration and travel, have you, do you see evidence of drying, of climate change, and any changes in animal behavior that you might attribute to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I see that everywhere. Um, interestingly, I was just in, in Yosemite um, a couple days ago uh, with, uh, with some rangers there who were doing interpretive work and doing biological work. And and looking at how lodgepole pines are moving into the meadows and, and, you know, really debating on what to do about this because it's, it's changing, it's changing the landscape. And, uh, and that's something that I see out here. I mean, between fires and uh, two years ago, the, the Creek that runs below the house here dried up. And I talked to the, the people who lived here for 25 years before us and they'd never seen that. And, uh, and there are beaver dams down there. I don't know what happened to the beaver, but they, uh, this is the second summer where the creek's running and the beaver haven't returned. Um, so I, I'm definitely seeing changes that, that both I haven't seen and I can, I can go back in time and talk to people or research and, and see how, how the changes that I'm seeing around here are significant. That they, they do historically stand out. So yes, yes. Uh, there's no doubt that the climate is, is changing and animals are, are of course changing with it, uh, moving their ranges to the north, uh, new animals showing up that haven't been seen before. It's, it's happening all over the place. Good. And someone asked, have you ever had a frightening animal encounter? Many. <laughs> I mean, with, uh, I mean, right my mind immediately flashes to, to times too close to grizzly bears in the Arctic. Um, um, at least one or two mountain lion encounters that were within five or six feet uh, of each other that, uh, that might not have been frightening for the mountain lion, but were frightening for me. Um, but you know, what also comes to mind is uh, like a, a, uh, uh, a praying mantis crawling up my arm, an animal that is beautiful and fascinating. I love praying mantises, but if you ever had one just show up out of nowhere and you're looking right into its face and it's got its, its claws raised up and you just think this thing can take me down. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had uh, plenty of frightening in encounters. And, uh, and, and I think about that as I travel out here, as I, get close to mountain lions. I mean, I think about, I, I travel unarmed and I did, you know, I've spent hundreds of days in the Alaskan backcountry unarmed, mostly because I didn't want to shoot my partner or my foot or uh, shoot the paw of an angry bear. Um, but, you know, the question comes up, should I have a firearm out here? Um, and how would I feel about inserting myself into an animal landscape? and then killing an aggressive animal because I happen to be there. Um, those things are on my mind. Yep, good. And kind of a segue from that. Do, do you feel we've become estranged from nature now to, the, now to the extent that it's now a lost cause trying to get back? I feel like we have become estranged and are becoming more estranged to the nature that is around us and getting more focused on the human nature. But I don't think it's a lost cause. I think it's far from a lost cause because I, I think it's always in us. I think you, you have the capability of, of smelling so much more, picking up so many more scents if you, if you paid attention to it. I, I think that I, I don't see the lost cause aspect of it. I can see that we're getting so far away that it, it sometimes feels terrifying. Um, but like children know immediately 
what the natural world is about. They know how to move into it. They, they respond directly to it. I think it is genetic. It's innate. We've been evolving for too many millions of years to not maintain that connection somehow genetically, physically. I think any of us thrown back into it would understand and on some level. So I, th I think it's far from a lost cause, but I do think we are, we are detaching more and more. Okay, and a perfect follow-up to that. Any insight, stories, activities to help young elementary students appreciate the perspective of humans as part of the natural world without making these small people feel even smaller and instead helping them feel connected and bigger in that sense? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, my immediate thought is, is get them out there and you know just where wherever it is if it's a vacant lot you know go go find crickets you know listen look in, listen for cricket song and say hey can you find the crickets that, that's making that song and without disturbing it like without making it stop singing um can you get up to it that slowly uh, or, you know, out here, you know, get them out into the trees, out into a park, out into anything. And the, I think the, the interesting part about that question is how to do it without making them feel smaller. Um, I think you lose sense of scale out there. And maybe it's reminding them that, that you're not small. It's just that you're... That it, that the scale is all over the place, that some things are bigger than you and some things are smaller. Focus on the cricket, focus on the worm, and then focus on the, the hawk flying overhead uh, in, in New York City. Focus on, on the coyote. You know, look at all the scales, but just get out there. Um, drop kids in a creek and, and take their shoes off and have them move around in it. I think that is the most important thing. I mean, that for me is what, what saves me, is, is getting out there and, and touching it, being in it. So I would, I would suggest the same. What nature authors most influenced you and will your boys be writers? <laughs> will my boys be writers? I can see my 13 year old is shaking his head furiously, no. Nope. <laughs> uh, my, which is fine. I think writing is a weird habit. Um, <laughs> uh, um, let's see. And my 17-year-old, he 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 writes, uh, but nothing like what I do. He writes a uh, um, crazy fantasy fiction, wild. Uh, I I couldn't even get into it. But um, they both do their own thing. Uh, Anne Zwinger was somebody who I picked up early. I, picked uh, her books up in, in high school, I think. Um, and she kind of started me on this path. Uh, Mary Oliver uh, is a poet who, who I'm, I feel very connected with in, in my writing. Also, uh, Barry Lopez is somebody who is, who is in, uh, very influential for me early on. So Anne Zwinger, um, Mary Oliver, Barry Lopez, uh, so more contemporary authors that I've that I've followed through since 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 my twenties, um, and uh, Gretel Ehrlich is is somebody who uh, who influenced me quite a bit. So those are those are four authors I've been with, and and I don't know if I I would hope my my children would would be writers. I'd, <laughs> I think there are many ways of experiencing and interacting with the world and writing is not the only one. And it's a beautiful, amazing life, but it is also complicated. You're constantly mining stories from the world, from yourself. And sometimes it feels like an extractive industry that you're trying to, to tone into a beautiful industry. So it's uh, writing is a complicated process. Amen. During your walks for House of Rain, did you have experiences that tied you to the ancient peoples and did animals factor in? Hmm. Huh. 
It was a while ago. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, the, the experience is tight. That was uh, where I, I, for House of Rain, I, I walked about a thousand miles around the Four Corners and down through Air, Utah and Arizona to Northern Mexico following um, pre-Columbian migrations, Pueblo, Pueblo culture. Uh, and of course, there were, I mean, you can't walk a hundred feet out here without finding some tie to ancestry, some human tie, some flake on the ground or, or pot shirt, or, or then as you get farther out, cliff dwellings. Um, so I was, I felt constantly tied to, to the ancestry in this landscape. And of course there are animals moving in and out all the time. I, um, I found a cliff dwelling in East central Arizona uh, that, it looked like a mountain lion had den there and had given birth inside the cliff dwelling. Uh, you could see the, the sheen on the ground where the placenta had fallen. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, the animal world is always moving in and out of the human world, especially in these ancient places, you know, following mountain lions through, through cliff dwelling sites down to a spring where they'd go to drink. Uh, the ancestry here in the animal realm is it's inseparable. Wow. And do you still sleep in caves sharing them with black widow spiders? I do. <laughs> I do. I get bit by things in caves. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still doing that. I mean, not as much as, as uh, I think in my thirties and early forties, I think uh, having kids, making a living, uh, that's that's um it's caused it to be much more focused i used to be out where i was just out all the time uh, most of the year i was on the ground but uh you know now i live in a building with a, a roof um but a lot of the summer my 13 year old and i had a tent set up outside uh, just a bug screen uh and yeah we sleep in caves um when the weather sends you in you find a hole and you get in it. From Tucson, we recently encountered two Gila, however you say it, Gila? Gila monsters, Gila monsters in our yard, probably a mating pair, big, beautiful lizards going about their business. Briefly, what do you think of Gila monsters? <laughs> I love Gila monsters. Uh, they look like they're, they're beaded and colorful, um, that kind of rusty red, orange, and, and deep black, uh, um, and, and, uh, if you live in Tucson, you know that you, you don't want to grab one, uh, because they are poisonous and they lock their jaws onto you. So they're, you can't pry them off. Um, my encounters have actually been pretty rare having two come in. That's, that's meaningful. I think that there, somebody asked earlier about the, the spirituality of animals. I, I think there is a, uh, each animal has a different relationship with the world and something different to convey. And it, I don't know what Gila monsters mean or what they bring, but every time I've seen one, it's been an extraordinary moment. So having two come into your world, I, I just consider yourself blessed and, <laughs> and watch, watch them as, as, as closely as possible. Well, you, you decide how close you want to get. Uh, here's a comment and then an, a little bit ne different topic. Uh, someone says, this conversation causes my mind to flash from interaction with wildlife moments. I think I remember those more than with people from interactions and observations with wildlife. Yeah. Just a comment. And then a little bit different tack. A few people had questions about your writing. One was if Ed Abbey was an influence yeah, I think so. I, I, uh, Monkey Wrench Gang was the, the book of his that I really connected with. Um, um, I love Desert Solitaire. Uh, I, I know in this era of looking back at, at people decades ago, we're, we're applying them to current politics and Ed, Edward Abbey is getting hammered, um, which I think he would love. Um, but he, yeah, I read, I read a lot of his stuff, but I also found when I was reading Desert Solitaire, I went, 
well, this is cool, but I'd rather be out there doing it. Um, so, so he more reminded me of, of where I want to be. I don't so much read the people who write in my zone, my geography, um, because I want to be in it rather than reading about it. It makes me antsy. Um, but I do, I, yeah, Edward Abbey is, is definitely an influence. And a comment, please keep writing, Craig. Not such a weird habit when you're gifted. <laughs> I, I, will, I will definitely keep writing. And then a question about your process. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Do your sketches play into